Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to part two of my um, cataloging, archiving, whatever you want to call it, my 3.5 Dungeons and Dragons collection. Uh, so hope everyone watching this already watched part one. Uh, I'm recording these sort of back to back, although um, part one was a bit of a struggle uh, just because I got like a really bad cold the previous week and it went sort of into my throat and I've been you know, having like coughing fits and stuff and <clears throat> the the time I spent talking about the first set of uh, books that I did in part one was the most I've actually spoken um, continuously um, in over a week <laughs> so it um, it was a little difficult um, to get through uh, but I did fix myself up a nice uh, cup of tea so that should hopefully help me get through uh, the rest of this video. It's a little bit more soothing um, than just regular water alone, I find. So anyway, uh, let's just get right back into it, shall we? <clears throat> Alright, so uh, the next book I want to talk about was not really an environmental source book, but it was a genre-style uh, source book. So this is Heroes of Battle. Um, so this was originally actually titled uh, Battlefield Adventures, but they changed the name um, sort of well after it was announced. Um, the, I, I wish I still, because I had the catalog <coughs> where it was initially announced as, as Battlefield Adventures, uh, but essentially what this does is it gives you some guidelines and some information on how to uh, make mass combat sort of work in your game. Um, I believe this is the one that uses, um, I haven't really opened it much, um, you can tell. <clears throat> but I think this is one that uses like a victory point system. Uh, if I recall correctly, I, I could be wrong though. I might be thinking of uh, something else, but it gives um, it gives quite a bit of useful information. Um, I really wanted to actually design, uh, maybe not necessarily an entire campaign, <clears throat> but one big adventure around using this book. But I just never got the opportunity to do it. Um, by the time I kind of had the opportunity to do it, I was well into running the uh, pre-written adventure paths that were coming out in, or that had come out in Dungeon Magazines. So I just never got the chance to use this book, and unfortunately none of the adventures in the, the magazines made use of it either. So this is one of those things that um, I think there's some useful information here. I think there's some cool stuff in here. Uh, unfortunately, I just never got a chance to really put it to use, which is unfortunate because this was a book that I was really looking forward to. It was just, again, all around uh, bad timing with um, you know how much I was working and everything else. But um, this is one that I would recommend checking out if you get the opportunity to. If you can find it at a good price, I do recommend this one. And to go along with that, we have the Heroes of Horror book. So this is, again, pretty straightforward. This this is a book designed um, or built around the idea of designing horror-themed campaigns, adventures, encounters, uh, things along those lines. It includes like prestige classes because, of course, everything in, in third edition had to have prestige classes in it. <clears throat> but um, this book in particular was kind of interesting. Is um, Around the time this came out, I really wanted to try to get my foot in the door of doing some freelance uh, writing for Dungeon Magazine, uh, for Paizo, actually. And uh, it's funny, because I, I talked to the PR guy um, on occasion, but I don't think I've ever actually mentioned this, and I'm hoping he doesn't actually watch this, because it might be kind of embarrassing. Uh, but reading the submission guidelines and the FAQ around it, one of the things that they suggested was it's much easier to get into the magazine if you uh, produce smaller articles <clears throat> rather than trying to start off with an adventure, especially because they were really getting into the adventure path stuff um, um, around this time. They were uh, well into Savage Tide, I think, at this point, or they were at least a few issues in. So, you know, space for adventures was kind of limited. But they had other things like um, they had, you know, some articles that were essentially like charts of a hundred um, things you might see uh, traveling down like a city road or, you know, hundred NPCs you might encounter uh, in the wild or, you know, on the road sort of thing. There was just a lot of stuff along those lines, but there were also what was called Critical Threats. <clears throat> and Critical Threats was a fleshed out, developed villain 
Uh, so you have the stat block and their backstory, tactics, and, and things like that. So uh, with a friend of mine, we were actually going to co-design um, an NPC or a villain to send in as one of these critical threats. Um, <clears throat> and we wanted to split it up um, sort of 50-50-ish. Uh, so basically it's like, you know, I will, you know, why don't you stat out the character and I'll write its backstory. And um, so, you know, you create the character and I'll see how I can make it work. And <laughs> he had also picked up Heroes of Horror. And um, the, the, the NPC that he sent back was this, like, Dread Witch Night Hag or something like that. And um, I was... I, I can't remember what I'd written for the backstory, but there were just certain things that didn't quite work with some of the feats or things that were taken. So I was like, well, this is the backstory that I came up with. Because he told me... He told me what he was making before he showed me the stats, so I was just going based off what he had told me. Um, so I was like, well, you know, we were starting to collaborate back and forth. But then Dungeon Magazine, uh, or Wizards of the Coast, or Paizo announced that the physical print runs of the magazines were coming to an end. Uh, and then we got the announcement of, like, 4th edition and all this stuff. So it was just, unfortunately, it was just too late <laughs> for us to get into actually being able to uh, to get anything submitted, which is a real shame, but this book, I will always remember that. I've never used the book myself uh, for anything. Again, with the Heroes of Battle, it was a book that I was interested in, that I wanted to do something with, um, but I was just not running uh, my own designed adventures at that point in time. Uh, I dare say that at least some of the thematic stuff that's talked about in this book would probably still be very relevant and useful today. So it's one of those things that I might have to look through it and see how useful it is um, as just flavor stuff and not really getting into necessarily mechanics, um, but how much you might be able to still use this or Heroes of Battle today. So that might be sort of a fun thing to do for uh, a future video. <clears throat> All right, up next we have a couple of compendiums, because like I said, I'm not really doing this in any super particular order. I know sort of what I want to talk about at, at the end. Um, so, these are the next two in the stack. The first one is what I consider to be, again, another essential pickup after the, like the, the core rule books in the Player's Handbook 2. Uh, but this is the original printing of the Spell Compendium. Uh, the Spell Compendium was such a well-received book that it was <clears throat> one of the few non-core rule books uh, that Wizards of the Coast would actually do a reprint for. Um, I think this is available, I know you, I know for sure you can get the PDF of it on DMs Guild, but I think you can also get it print on demand, uh, but the version of the book that they have there is, the, the cover is based off of the, the 2013 reprint. Uh, but this is a collection of all the spells that appeared in other books, at least all the spells sort of to that time. Uh, first party stuff, there may be, be some stuff that's original to this book itself, but it just sort of compiles everything um, into one book. It does not include the player's handbook spells, um, because it's kind of redundant, and I understand why they didn't do it. I think there's this, like, the spell lists have all the spells, including the player's handbooks one in the lists, but in the actual descriptions it only has the ones that are unique to this book. Uh, because, again, you know, it's assumed that you're going to have your own player's handbook, so you'd have probably both of these together anyway. So, uh, But this book was so useful, and it was just always great to, especially, you know, if the players didn't really have this, or the other players in the group, and you wanted to introduce some unique spells, you could put a few of the spells from this book in, like, an enemy's wizard spell book or something like that, and just some really, really cool stuff. Um, again, a very if you're going to play 3.5 and you want to play a spellcaster, be it wizard, sorcerer, druid, cleric, bard, um, heck, even ranger and paladin spells are much better <laughs> in this book than they were in the player's handbook. So there's a lot of great stuff in here. Spell Compendium cannot recommend enough. And then we have the Magic Item Compendium. This is the second of three compendium books that were released. I never did get the third one. It was, again, around the time that I felt like Wizards was kind of spinning their wheels or the well had sort of run dry and they were just trying to put stuff out until fourth came. <clears throat> but this one here is a collection of magic items. Um, it's a good book. There's some cool stuff in here. My only gripe with it, <clears throat> and I know why they had to do it, 
but the magic items are categorized differently in this than they were in, say, the Dungeon Master's Guide. So, instead of having, like, weapons, armor, um, potions, scrolls, rods, staffs, wands, and then your miscellaneous, um, the miscellaneous stuff is really broken down into uh, body slots. So, like, you'd have um, hands for, like, gloves or something like that, arms for gauntlets and other things along those lines. You'd have body, you'd have um, <clears throat> just, you had all these different things, but it made it a little bit more cumbersome to try to use this book to create random treasure. If you would just, if you, like, using the DMG, you would roll miscellaneous. You, then you had to go through with these other charts, and I, I just never really felt that I got as much use out of this one, unfortunately. Um, there were some really cool items in it, and it's not saying that nothing got used, um, but I would not use it for random treasure. I would only use it if I had rolled up treasure ahead of time, and I didn't always do that because there were times that I kind of like getting the players involved and let them roll the percentiles and uh, sort of see what they find, so I, didn't, I wasn't rolling everything at the time. And I still don't to this day, actually, because I like getting the players sort of involved in that process. So uh, this was used more for outfitting, like, NPCs and stuff like that. That's sort of how I was using it at the time. Uh, but it is a good book, and it is very, very useful. Uh, the Rules Compendium I don't know a whole lot about, but I was told that it was also a decent book. I just didn't feel like I needed it. Um, and, again, it was just at that point in time in which running stuff or trying to sit down and read books was the furthest thing from my mind because I was essentially, you know, 16 hours a day away from home uh, doing work stuff and then coming home and then literally just crashing and going to bed. So, uh, but this one again was a cool book. Um, the, the format, the way they have it laid out is sort of what would become the standard for 4th edition. Um, not so much 5th edition, but the 4th edition also used the same uh, like body slot sort of classification for their stuff. And it's a good system, it's actually really organized. It was just kind of difficult to work with in conjunction with the much broader category of miscellaneous items that you had in the DMG. But still, a good book overall. Alright, up next we're going to get into the complete series of books. Uh, so these are sort of class-based, or player-based supplements, giving them new class options for various types of roles. So we're just going to get right into it uh, with Complete Warrior. Um, of the the first four or five, which were, for the, really, they were all pretty good, this is one of the ones that I think got used the least. Um, this was sort of uh, stuff for like combat-based classes. Um, it had a ton of prestige classes because, again, everything did. Like half the book was made up of prestige classes, and of varying quality, uh, if we're going to be honest. Uh, but this did have, I think, this is the one that had like the swashbuckler, uh, the hex blade, because I see that one right there, and like the the kensai, I think. Uh, hex blade, samurai, swashbuckler. Oh, didn't have the kensai. Uh, Samurai Swashbuckler, and then there were variant stuff for... Uh, the one thing that did get used, actually, uh, was the variant Paladins and Rangers that removed their spellcasting abilities in exchange for something better, or different, I guess you could say. Um, <clears throat> mainly because the spellcasting ability of Paladins and Rangers in 3rd Edition and 3.5 was not very good. Like, I think they were 6th or 7th level. Um, May, they may have been as, as early as 5th level, having like, uh, for their first level spell slots, having 0 and needing to have a bonus spell for their spellcasting attribute. Uh, it just, they just didn't get a lot of use out of, out of them. So the non-spellcasting variants were actually really, really useful, and they were the things that got used the most um, in, this, in this book, at least in my personal experience. Um, but again, not bad, just not the most used of the ones. They're, they're pretty much all the other books sort of outshined it. After that came Complete Divine. And again, they're all very similar, uh, sort of these books. So Complete Divine uh, focused on like druids, um, druids, clerics, and I think there was stuff for paladins and, and other things along those lines in here as well. Uh, this also had, um, God, what was the name of that? Because that's, that's going to 
bug me right now, but we had the different favorite soul. So this said the favorite soul, the Shigenja and the Spirit Shaman. Uh, the Shigenja and the Spirit Shaman, I wasn't interested in at all. Um, again, I just never felt that the more like Oriental Adventure style classes, I just didn't find that they meshed well with the European style. Um, you know that the rest of the D and D world sort of had. Um, <clears throat> now, if you were using a setting that had like you know the like an Oriental Adventures type of setting in it, um, then I think there's some cool stuff that you could do with it. Um, but it just wasn't something that seemed to make sense to me, but the Favored Soul was really cool because it was essentially a sorcerer version of a cleric. So they had spontaneous casting, they didn't prepare spells, and a lot, again, in my experiences, people moved or gravitated towards the spontaneous classes because you had more flexibility, you had less selection of spells overall, but you had more flexibility in how you cast the spells that you know. And I think ultimately that was just more important. And we sort of see how, again, that became the norm. Um, so in 5th edition, for example, your spellcasters, even if they have to choose which spells they have prepared for the day, um, <clears throat> you didn't have to choose, like, if you want to cure wounds, you didn't have to select cure... I mean, that's a bad example for 3rd edition. Um, let's go with Bless. If you wanted to have the Bless spell, you didn't have to... Like, in 5th edition, you could just prepare Bless, and then you could cast it with all of your spell slots if you essentially wanted to. Um, but in back in these days, you had to, if you wanted Bless, you had to choose, you had to, like, say you had four spell slots, and you wanted to cast Bless, well, if you only wanted to cast it once, you memorize it once, but if you thought it might be useful in a couple of fights because you're going into a larger dungeon sort of thing, then you might have to memorize it of two or three of those spell slots, and then you were locked in. Clerics were a little bit different because they could swap out their spells for a cure spell of equal level, um, which was fine, or equal or lower level, I should say, uh, which was fine, and it was a good workaround for the cleric, but it just still seemed like, at least in my personal experiences, that the spontaneous classes were the ones that people tended to prefer playing. And so having the favorite soul, which was the, the, the divine version of that for all of their spells, uh, was actually really, really cool. And uh, it was my favorite class out of the book. All right, so up next came the most useful, in my opinion. Uh, this is Complete Arcane. Uh, so this is for your arcane spellcasters. It has, you know, all kinds of, again, prestige classes, feats, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but this was the book that it wasn't the first book that had this class, uh, but it was the book that most people that played the class probably got it from, and it had the War Mage. So, <laughs> and I opened it right up to it. Uh, so the War Mage was basically a sorcerer. Uh, they had divine, or not divine, they had spontaneous spell casting. Uh, the, 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 I think they could only choose from, like, evocation and maybe one other school of magic, so they were limited in what they could do, but they could also wear armor and not have it affect their spell casting. Uh, and they could add their ability score modifier to the damage of their spells. Now, if you had like a multi-target spell, like Magic Missile, you could only apply your spell casting modifier to one of the missiles instead of all of them. But it was still a really, really cool class. And once this book came out, um, I think that was the only class that I saw people playing for Arcane at my table. And in fact, in two different campaigns, uh, two different players, completely independent of one another, um, went with the War Mage because they just thought it was the cooler class um, of the Spellcasters. So, really, really awesome book. And again, there's some, some cool stuff in here, but I loved it for that. Um, and then I think it had... God, what were the other two? The other two classes did not get used much uh, in my uh, in in my campaigns, at least. Uh, so we had the warlock, which okay, the warlock did get used, which was different from the hexblade back then. Uh, and then you had the Wu Gen, which I don't think ever got used, or one person maybe made one because he thought it might annoy me. Um, but other than that, um, the war mage though was an absolute hit. And then we have complete adventurer. So this is for your spill, uh, spill your uh, skill-based characters, so your rogues, your bards, um, things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the new classes that were introduced in here, but the one cool one that I actually really liked was the scout, 
which was sort of a skirmisher type character. So they were all about hit and run tactics and stuff like that. So they had a version of sneak attack, but the way that it worked was they had to move, make the attack, and then move after the attack, and they, you know, resisted attacks of opportunity and stuff like that. But it was a really, really cool class, and again, this wasn't the most used book of the four that I've shown so far. Complete Arcane was definitely the most heavily favored, but there was some really, really cool stuff uh, in here. All right, I haven't gotten to the source material yet for this, um, so I guess this might be a spoiler for another book that I'm about to show off, but this is Complete Psionic. I thought about waiting on this one until I did the Psionics book, but I want to keep these together because they're going to go back on my shelf. Um, so Complete Psionic, um, I'm not going to talk too much about Psionics right now, uh, but this was one of those books that if you wanted to play a Psionic character, this was like a must-have book. Uh, so some cool stuff in here, some new classes like all the other ones. Um, and uh, prestige classes, feats, uh, new Sonic abilities. Just a really, really great book if you were into playing a Sonic character. Like I said, this was pretty much a, uh, a no-brainer. And then we start getting into the what I consider to be the downward uh, spiral of this series. Uh, I feel like Complete Sonic is probably where they should have left it off. Uh, three more books came out in the series. I only picked up two of them. Um, apparently the one that I missed out was actually good again. Uh, but these two, I just didn't really get any use out of hardly at all. So here we have Complete Scoundrel. Um, I honestly can't tell you much about this book. Um, I remember looking through it. I think this was actually the first one of the Complete series that didn't have core classes. So this actually didn't have, uh, so this didn't have like a new class to sort of carry a concept with, like the the War Mage, or the um, the the Hex Blade, or the um, the Favorite Soul, or nothing. There was just none of those classes. This was just purely new options to make you know a scoundrel type character, and no one used this book in my group. <laughs> Uh, nobody asked to really look through it. Um, nobody, I don't think, I don't think a single option was ever selected out of this book. And um, I, I remember just sort of flipping through it casually and just like there's nothing in here that I want to use. Um, but that's my personal experience. Um, so for those who, this, you know, for people out there, this may be their favorite, you know, supplement book for 3rd for edition or 3.5. And if it is, that's great because I'm glad someone got use out of it. It just didn't appeal to my sensibilities and to me, it didn't feel like it needed to be made. Um, I think all the best ideas clearly went into Complete Adventurer, which was only, there was only one other book in this series. Uh, separating the two, and they weren't really, I don't think they were that far apart. Um, so I just, again, this this felt like the beginning of, we just need to throw stuff out there, so things that we sort of didn't go with before, let's just put them in a book. And that's also sort of exemplified in Complete Mage. So where Complete Arcane was, in my opinion, the best of this whole series, Complete Mage was the book that just sort of made me not want to get any more complete books. So I didn't get Complete Champion, which again, I've heard people say is actually really good. Um, and again, if there's people out there that got use out of this book, then that's great and that's awesome and I'm glad. Uh, because regardless of what I think of this, people did spend you know their time and effort and energy into in, you know putting this stuff into print. It just, again, didn't resonate uh, with me and it just didn't feel like there was enough interesting stuff in here to actually, for me, to warrant the book having been made. So other people will hopefully disagree with that. And again, this was another one of the complete books <coughs> that didn't have core classes. So, so you didn't have like a new class you could play from first to 20th level. It was just, you know, just more options in a system that already had, admittedly, or, or you know, in my opinion, way too many options already. Um, so if you're not going to introduce like a new core class to synergize with the new options that you're putting in the book, it just again it just didn't feel like it was particularly useful, and I and I, and I never used it, and I don't think anyone in my group um, ever used it either. I, like I think a couple of them may have looked through it because of how much they like complete arcane, but it just never 
never really got any any love in my group, and I feel bad for that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it is what it is, I guess you could say. And I'm hoping that there are people out there that had a completely different experience with this book and loved it to death. And I really hope that that's the case because, you know, none of these books deserve to be hated. Um, and I don't say that I hate this book um, because that's that's really strong emotion to apply to, you know, a, a hobby. Um, but it was disappointing for me at least. So I guess we'll we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> All right, and then up next we've got the Planer Handbook. So this one was another one of those books that I got sort of at a time when I didn't have a lot of time or energy to dedicate to reading through these books or learning anything new. Um, but I believe this is sort of like a player's guide to like playing... I don't want to say Planescape, but playing characters from, you know, different different planes of existence or things that they can do if you wanted to do like a plane hopping campaign. There are new races in here and there is information or substitute features for all of the the core rulebook classes, which is pretty cool. Uh, prestige classes, obviously spells, um, and a little bit of information for some of the different planes of existence. Uh, but again, this would be like the player's version of the Manual of the Planes, which came out for 3.0. Uh, and that book was a pretty cool book. Um, I actually really liked Manual of the Planes. I'm glad I finally was able to get my hands on a copy of it all these years later. Uh, but this was a really, really cool uh, book as well. Um, there was some planar stuff uh, put into the 3.5 DMG, and this sort of was meant to work off of that. But again, I, just, I don't have any real personal experience with this book, and I know that kind of sounds awful. Um, but it was just one of those things that I'll get it because it's coming out and then I'll try to figure out a way to, to work it into a game and then just life kind of got in the way unfortunately. Um, but the stuff that I r did read through, I can't remember specifics, but I do remember liking a lot of the stuff that was in there. Uh, there was just nothing that stood out super well to me. Hey everybody, um, I was originally planning on this being just a two-part uh, series, but looking at the lengths of some of the videos, I feel like it's probably better to split this up into three. Um, that way they're all sort of around the same time instead of one video being half an hour and then the next one being like over twice as long as that. So uh, I'm probably going to you know, break this into a, uh, this will be the end of part two and I will be doing uh, part three. It's already all recorded. I'm just going to sort of do this and insert them into the videos to try to make it make a little more sense. But uh, just looking at the times, um, it, it ran kind of long and uh, I tried to rush myself up <laughs> uh, to to get through everything. But at the same time, uh, it still ended up being a lot longer than I was expecting, so I'm going to, like I said, uh, make this the end of part two, and uh, then the next video will be part three, and I'm going to upload these like one day, or, or maybe have like one day in between, um, just sort of digest, um, so it's not like I'm being like overloading everyone. Uh, but yeah, I had a lot of fun recording it, and I don't want to have to redo it and try to shorten everything up. So we're going to leave it as is, and I'm just going to say this is part two, and I will see you in a couple of days for part three.